when I'm gonna flow being like, oh, this is so fun. Oh my God, this is like my curiosity is just like on the page. That's gonna be the best writing. I think that's an interesting idea of research as chasing of surprise. I just learn something new or something just clicks and boom, like dopamine hit. You wrote 300 posts and your drawings don't even begin to emerge. I wasn't trying to be a, a writer. I was just, just having fun. That's gold. Once you start to take something seriously, parts of your brain can literally stop working. It's easy to, when you're writing a book, especially to think that you're writing it for the most snooty critic. <laughs> that person does not matter. One of the things that struck me as I was preparing for this interview, I think of you as somebody with a super distinct style, the colors and the stick figure drawings and just the way that you explain things. I didn't realize that you had a blog before Wait But Why that you wrote from ages 23 to 29. You wrote 300 posts. And here's what's interesting. I went through, went through, went oh, through, wow. and I was looking at Old them. school. And your drawings don't even begin to emerge until the end of yes. that era. So your style is something that comes out of that, but it takes like 300 posts. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, um, that was my procrastination activity before it became the thing I was supposed to be doing. Um, when when Wait But Why started, it became a full-time job. Before that, it was what I was supposed to not be doing. Hmm. Um, it was, you know, I was supposed to do other stuff that I'm supposed to be doing. And so I would uh, procrastinate by, I'd, oh, I'll, or I'll, you know, I'm just going to actually just have an idea for a blog post quickly and then I'll, then I'll get back to the work. Um, and so that's, so I became prolific because, you know, procrastinators are great at producing um, uh, in the areas where they're not supposed to be. Um, and yeah, it was just, I think part of what was the reason I did it so much is because it was fun because there was no pressure. I wasn't trying to be a, a writer. I wasn't trying to be a good writer. I wasn't trying to be any writer. I was just, just having fun. Like, you know, it's, it's almost like uh, if I had a funny day, I would send in, you know, back at, then email was, you know, a little bit more of a social thing than it is now. I would send an email to six friends or whatever. And I would, you know, explain in, in you know, my funny, a funny story about my day. Basically, it was just that publicly. Um, and you know, no, I don't think people, when they're writing a funny story to their friends, I don't think they're thinking I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being a, I'm, I'm being a writer right now. I'm, they're just talking to their friends over text. So basically, it was just that. And then, you know, when you start playing in the sandbox, you start to find stuff you didn't know. You know, okay, I'm gonna actually start doing lists. And this was, by the way, I feel like before the BuzzFeed and all those, they ruined listicles and became like such a trite format. I, I mean, I didn't invent the list article, but it wasn't like a huge thing yet. And I started doing like 19 things I don't understand or like 25 things that annoy me. And, um, and, and I think it was actually kind of a fresh format. Then people were like, oh, this is fun. And then they totally got ruined. So I can't do them anymore. But, <laughs> um, but like, I didn't know, I didn't think when, when I first started about writing lists, but then I realized that was fun because I did it once and I liked it. And then the same thing towards the very end, um, I one day was like, what if I like, I didn't even know how do you how do you draw something, and then get it onto the into the computer. Like I just, you know like how do you get it onto the block? It was just this was so long ago. I was like a, a drawing tablet, and then you draw, and then you can save the file, and you can upload. I mean, this, was, this seems obvious now, but like back then, I was like, can I even upload an image into this like basic blogger? Turns out you can, and so I started doing these cartoons, and and then you know. The, the readers really liked them and it was really fun. And I was like, oh, this is a whole new like thing. But again, just kind of discovered that by playing in the sandbox. Yeah, they're incredible. They're, they're goofy. And what I think that I really admire about you is the juxtaposition between goofiness and like, this is how AI is gonna evolve. Yeah. And like, even in your Elon post, you're like, hi, you're Elon Musk. And there's an awkwardness that you, sort of right into that piece that is really well portrayed through those cartoons. And it's what allows anybody who goes on Wait But Why to be like, oh, I remember that site. Because so many websites look the same. Mm. Yours looks totally different. Like even the thick figures move and stuff like that. And what I like about that, beyond the fact that it's just cool and distinct and unique, is that it's super you. And it's very aligned with who you really are as a human being. Yeah, that's because that's I think it started with the, the old blog. It was basically the activity was just being me online, you know, like and and that's kind of still what I feel like I'm doing. Um, you know, it's more 
real writing now. It's more like real topics now, for sure. But I think that the core is still just um, me kind of hanging out with readers and like talking. And there's a lot of like, you know, I think there's a there's a spectrum of, you know, how much the writer is a character in the writing. Mm. So like on one end, it's like a super academic thing where you will read an entire book. And I read a lot of these by an, a scientist or whatever. And they can be great. They can be great books. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just you, you finish the book and you don't know anything about the writer. You don't know what their personality is like. You don't know if they're funny. You don't know what any of their quirks. You don't know what what they do in their spare time. You know nothing about them because that's not the point. You know, a journalist, it's a lot of journalists, you know, you're reading a front page New York Times article, not an op-ed. You're not going to know pretty much anything about the writer. An op-ed, you're going to start to know, you're going to know a lot more about the writer because the point of an op-ed is to, it's, first of all, it's just the concept is it, it is your, their opinion. Right. So you already, you know their opinion, but you also, there's a lot of personality in those, in those articles in an op-ed. You know, the, there's a range there too, though. Some really put, a, you know, like William Sapphire or certain, you know, pe- people put a ton of personality. It's Hunter really, Thompson. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he, he is, that's the ultimate. He's, you know, um, and so I, that's just a spectrum that I think any writer should think about. And, and by the way, it can be different for different articles. Um, I put, I'm, I, if I'm writing about procrastination, I'm going to be, like really, you know, putting myself into the article. If I'm writing about, you know, I don't know, yeah, like AI, um, less so, but still, what you're going to hear, you, you're not going to, fi- you're going to finish that article, and you're going to not just know about AI, but you're going to know about my freak out while researching AI. And you're going to know about like why my mind is so blown and like where I am at the end of this. So you're still going to know a lot. Um, and um, I don't think, again, I don't think that's better or worse. I think there, there's some of the best writers don't put themselves in. There's no reason you have to. It's almost like, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis. Do we know anything about who he actually is in his spare time from watching his movies? No, but he's one of the best actors in the world um, versus, you know, Louis C.K. on stage, right? You're getting to know him quite well. Um, and so, again, it's not one's better or worse. It's just it's interesting to even just think about that as a spectrum. I like that you use the word hanging out because when I think of your writing, I don't just think of what ideas are going to be shared. When I open up, wait, but why? I feel like I'm stepping into an environment that you've created and that you are curating a visual experience and then I can laugh and experience your epiphanies. And basically the way that I think about what you're trying to do with your writing is say that you're researching something over six months. You have a whole emotional journey that you go through. And then basically when you're writing, you're like, okay, I'm gonna squash that emotional experience so that you as the reader can experience that same arc, at least the highlights, in 45 minutes. And that's what makes your writing so emotionally resonant in a way that truly is like nobody else I know on the internet. Someone talked about, uh, I think it's Julian, um, Julian Shapiro, talked about like the dopamine hit density in his writing, something like that. Like, um, and I, I, I love that because um, when I'm researching, a lot of it is dry, a lot of it's boring. And then I read something fascinating, something that I just learned something new or something just clicks, or it's an incredibly interesting fun fact, um, or just something, a connection gets made and boom, like dopamine hit, like, you know, just, just like this, like, this, like, you know, jolt of kind of it's like euphoric little jolt of like intellectual excitement. Um, or you're watching a stand-up comedian and they say something so hilarious and true in the perfect words. Dopamine hit, right? Like yeah. what an enjoyable moment <laughs> because, they, right? And so it can be, and I'm in a conversation with a friend and we, we come up with something and it's like, oh, that's good. Or I'm just thinking, I'm just like daydreaming. And I'm like, oh, that's such like a funny, like, way to compare that thing to this. Okay, dopamine. Or, you know, often I'm researching and I'm just like, I'll research for three hours and get, um, you know, seven minutes of, of dopamine hits. Okay, so now my goal when I'm writing is to take all those collected thoughts and insights and, um, and, and you know, re- re- research ahas and now give a much denser version, right? So like what I, there's a lot of my research time is bored. Um, or confused, or, you know, feeling like I already know this. Um, And so, yeah, it's just trying to filter, 
down to the you know to distill uh, the best moments, um, which I think a lot of writers, of course, that's like what that's 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 what that's part of why we like to read, um, is because someone out there has done a lot of work to bring us like the best. You know, the, the stand-up comedian is the ultimate example because th th this is like the funniest thoughts they've had that year or in maybe in the last decade, right? And the absolute best, and then they've then they go out and they test them. And the ones that really click, they keep, and then they keep coming up with funny ideas. And what you're seeing, when you're seeing like an HBO special on one of these hour specials, is you're seeing like the best of the best of the best of the best, aha, aha like funny moments they've had. Um, and you get to just watch it for one straight hour and it's just one thing after the other, right? And it's not that they're like the most brilliant person, it's that you, their, their craft is distilling the funniest insights of their decade into this hour for you. You know, it's just, it's cool. Comment, then a question. So Raymond Chandler, the novelist, he used to write on his typewriter and it would have about 250 words per page. And his rule was that on every single page that would come out, there had to be one of those moments of insight. And if it didn't have it, then it wasn't dense enough, which is sort of like what you're saying. My question about almost a decade ago, when I was just getting started in writing, I was doing a summer internship in New York City, and I saw you at a coffee shop, and I was too scared to say Aww. hi. So how's this for a decade later? I also feel like I met you the first time in Central Park. Is that we correct? Uh-huh. Okay. We were sitting. I went to the Wait But Why meetup. I remember that. Um that was a long time ago. I was like that was a long time ago. That was a fun day. <laughs> Thanks it was for like coming. The global, the global media. <laughs> yeah, that day. was fun. Yeah, yeah. We should do that again. That was great. Yeah, it's the internet's cool. You can just like, you can start a blog and um, and people from all over the world, you know, who happen to click with your ideas can find you. And then it's like, um, you know, you can when any anyone anyone publishing a Substack um, when they publish. Their audience, it's like, it's not this audience of people in the room sitting with them. It's literally like they're scattered around the planet reading this article. It's very, it's crazy. Like they're, they're thousands of miles apart, but they're all reading the same thing. It's weird. When you were in those early days of writing, how consciously did you cultivate your voice? Not very consciously at all because, um, uh, it, it was it was literally just like a fun activity for me. And so like it was the opposite of um, writing college papers and high school papers, which I hated. Yeah. Which it's the opposite of fun, the, those papers. It's it's you have you have to you have an extremely rigid form of topic sentence, you know, thesis statement and topic sentences, and you have to um you have to, you know, cite every sentence and it's just it's just it just takes any form of no personality at all is supposed to be in those papers. Um, and it's often based on a lot of dry reading. And this first blog, no research, no format, you know, n extremely informal. And you know, I had a funny idea, a, a funny list. Um, I have, I, 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 I realized it's weird that we all own dogs. Like that's a weird concept. Okay, I'm gonna go and just write that for. 20 minutes, three paragraphs and post it. So um, th there really wasn't, I think, but I think what happens is you do develop a voice. You know, you start to develop a voice, but for me it was very not intentional because I really truly wasn't taking it seriously as a craft for almost, I, it, 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 you know, I wrote for six years on that first blog and I, I almost never want at any point said, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get big as a writer. I'm gonna like go for this. You know, there's something to this, how once you start to take something seriously, all of a sudden, parts of your brain can literally stop working. Oh yeah. So if I'm like hanging out at the bar with a friend or I'm on a walk, whatever, I will just come up with ideas and it's just sort of what I do and it's like, ooh, that's cool, that's cool. But then the second it's like, okay, now you need to like come up with this idea, it needs to be good. All of a sudden, I feel like I get this block and there's something to the fact that you are writing without being a writer for six years and I wonder if you would have gotten something so distinctive if you hadn't had that time period of testing and playfulness and experimentation. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and I might not just have had the confidence to write in like such a specific me voice because um, I might not have thought that that's like what writers should do. But I knew from 300 posts that at least some people, it wasn't a huge audience, but I knew that it resonated with some people. So I said, okay, I, I know this is appealing to some people, so I can just keep doing it. I had learned that without, you know, I learned that lesson without having to, you know, um, 
you know, just by accident kind of. Um, but I totally agree with you where it's like, I'll sometimes be trying to write something and I'll be writing in a, in a certain, um, I'm trying to explain, you know, for a current book I'm working on, I'll be trying, you know, I'll be trying to, I'll, I'll write some, I'll, I'll explain something in the book. And then I'll say, you know, I'm going to go and write like a long tweet to subscribers um, <laughs> about this concept because it's interesting, whatever. And I go in the, and I with, you know, suddenly I'm just on Twitter and I'm just writing it out and I'm like, okay, no, but, but I'm not going to, this isn't for the book. Let me just, ex let me just explain it. And I realize I'm like, what, this is better than what, why did I, this is what I should be doing there. It's like, what, these are the same people I'm writing for here. Just explain it like you're having fun on Twitter. Um, and I have to go back and remind myself that. And it's like, you know, you're not writing um, for the, it's, it's easy to, when you're writing a book, especially to think that you're writing it for the, the most um, snooty critic. <laughs> You know, and like, oh, okay, I need to like, and it's like, that is, that person does not matter. The people that you would, the, for, for me, like the people that I'm writing to on Twitter, like my silly readers who I'm friends with like in my head, like we're all friends, the kind of, that's the, uh, that's the only people that, that matter here. Um, and like, and it's like, just, just, you know, people who don't like that, that's totally fine. But it's, it's hard. It's, it's very hard to remember that, especially with a book. You're like, oh, the New York Times might review this. Like, and then that just makes you think about that. Yeah. I want to talk yeah. about what I'm calling Chapter 11 Bankruptcy, which yeah. is what you experienced in your book. And I guess you wrote yeah. the first 10 chapters. Oh, and then Chapter 11, you were just like, oh, oh my goodness, what happened? Basically, Chapter Okay, so this was a series called The Story of Us, and then it turned into a book called What's Our Problem? But it was, it was a, uh, it was supposed to be just a blog post. And then it was like, oh, there's so much to say. I'm trying to figure out why society is all messed up. And then I realized, okay, I'm gonna like tell them, I'm gonna explain this using like a first a bunch of just like new frameworks we can use to like look at society through like this thing we're all looking at. Let's like look at it through an unfamiliar lens since we're and 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 you know here's like a new pair of glasses and now let's see if it looks different to us and we can get some insights that's like the first few parts of this online series and then i, I was like okay let's get into the history let's talk about you know how we got to this point and then finally in the you know chapter 11 out of 12, the 12th is just a little conclusion. So chapter 11 is going to be this meaty chapter about um, just some examples in the real world. So now let's apply this to the real world. And we'll do a few examples over here and a few examples over here. And then the, that examples chapter, I just got really sucked in. And I realized like there is so much to say. If I really want to explain what's going on with the specific politics now, because it's not history and it's not just theory. Now I'm talking about what is going on like in the news like last week. And why is the reaction? What's the not I don't not I didn't get into policy. I'm not talking about why one side's right or the other or like, you know, what the what the right policies are. That's that's not this book. This book was why is everyone being so tribal about everything? Why are the lies spreading so so well? Why do people hate their family members right now? Right. Like what is going on? So I started getting into specific movements and I started getting into, you know, the, and then the history of those movements and how it came together. And then like, how does this, and that just ended up being longer than the whole other 10 chapters combined. And I said, I can't, this is insane. I can't publish a hundred thousand word chapter. So I said, okay, I'm just going to make this a book so people can like uh, read it. Uh, as, Cause this is, this is a blatant book. Now, usually my other long posts are kind of books, but like they're short books or long blog posts. This is just a book. Yeah. So then I turned it into a book and then that raised the standards. Now I said, well, now it really has to be, you know, airtight. And I really want to go and by the way, a lot's changed since I wrote the first 10 chapters. So let me go back and rework all those and condense them. I've also gotten feedback on those 10. That was actually kind of nice because I had posted them. So I had hundreds of comments. Some very critical, some very positive people arguing with each other. That was incredibly valuable. I mean, it's usually don't get that. So I had this, I had, I had already completely talked about scientific method. I had taken these 10 chapters and thrown them through a very kind of a, a gauntlet. And it came out, they came out tattered with something standing and something's broken. And I said, okay, cool. Now let's, let's make a bigger, better, tighter version of those. And then let's condense that last chapter 11. And that became this book, What's Our Problem? Tell me about Bakari Kafili. I guess he was writing this blog about Story of Us and... Well, I'm publishing, you know, multiple posts about politics, you know, 
getting pretty spicy, which you know, for the first time, I hadn't really gone in that direction very much. And so there's a lot of, you know, that's going to bring a lot of critical comments in. And also a lot of the comments section that people are going to be arguing with each other. Um, and uh, some of the critical comments were ad hominem attacks, you know, or just, you know, this is so disappointing coming from you, blah, 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 blah. It's, it, it's you know, I, I, it, you, I, I could pretty quickly wade out a lot of the comments. These are, these are very tribal political people who are, seems like, when I look at the substance of what they're saying, they're mostly just really mad that I don't agree with their tribe, right? They're, and, and they're attacking me. Okay. But there's a whole other group of critical comments that were really substantive. And we're saying, you know, you're, you know, um, you're missing the forest for the trees here or because of this, this, and this. Or, um, you know, there's an inconsistency with your argument here, you know, uh, or your, you know, your bias is showing here. Okay. Okay. You know, and it doesn't feel good. You'd rather everyone love it. But, it's important to read those and to reflect on them, especially if this is a topic you're going to either write about more in the future or in my case, if you're about to turn this into a book, like that's gold, you know, it's like, it's like you're trying to build a machine you're going to put out in the world and someone kicks the machine and says, look, it's broken there. And that's what, you know, that's what it is. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe you look and you say, no, it wasn't broken. And that happens a lot. Sometimes I look at the criticism and I think, no, I think that this person's missing the forest for the trees. Fine. But sometimes I'm like, Damn it! You know what? They're, they had, there's right. So this is, was one commenter on the blog. His his like um, screen name, his avatar is Jacob Azizas, um, or Jacob Aziza, and um, and I was like, this this guy's annoying me because his comments are really like they're on point and they're long and they're thorough. So I I, I just reached out to him and I said, you know, are you interested in potentially reading um, a draft of this book for feedback? And he was like so down to do that and wrote back with like extremely thorough comments and like the book is better because of him. I'm like extremely grateful. So I really, you know, if, if again, I happen to have um, the, the, this, this opportunity to even find him because I had published this on the blog ahead of time. But I think, you know, if someone has a very thoughtful critic who's in, in the end doing you a service by putting all this time into giving these comments, um, this is a service, take it. Talk to me about the feeling in your brain when you get stuck. And like, I want to hear about that negative feeling, that feeling where you're feeling really agitated. Maybe you're hating yourself. You're like, ah, oh, I just can't do this anymore. Like, what is that like for you? I know it so well. Um, <laughs> um, it's especially it happens with longer things. With shorter things, you know, you can kind of see the end. Um, it, I feel like there's, it, it's, it's just difficult in a different way to do a good short thing. The long things is when you just get tired of writing, you just, um, you, cause it's, you know, especially since I think in some ways I, I'm not doing a, um, I'm not doing academic writing where it's always the same tone. It's always a kind of a very straight tone. And, and so you're just trying to, you know, it does, you don't have to keep it, you know, interesting, um, tone wise as you go. You're, but I'm trying to, I, I don't want to just be doing chronological and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And I'm also trying, um, to, vary the tone a little bit. And I, I want it to be a fun read. There's, there's, you know, hitting a snag because the next thing is just really daunting. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't feel like I understand it that well. And I know I have to research more and it's just icky and I don't feel very confident and in, in about in my ability to write this section. Okay. That that's going to snag me. I'm just going to do anything else than I was going to icky avoid that. Mm -hmm. Or I'm like, no, I know my stuff now, but I have to organize. I don't know what order to put it all in. Like, there's so much to say about this. And I, it's like, I don't know how I'm going to wrangle this story into like a streamlined thing that's not so long. Okay, that's icky. I'm going to avoid it now because I, I haven't like, um, or, okay, no, I, I know what I know what I'm going to say. And I know the order I'm going to say it in. And I just, it's just, um, I'm stuck trying to, how, I'm not writing good writing right now. I'm like being boring. I'm just like, I'm just trying to plod through this and I can tell and the reader is going to know that, you know, I have to, I, I should be having fun. Every section should have a fun thing going on. You know, I should never be, if I'm, someone gave me some advice once with, um, when I was preparing for, um, my Ted talk, they said, um, if there's a part when you're practicing that you always hate and you're like, oh, I hate this part. I just want to get through it that's going to be like the worst part of the talk. The audience is going to don't just don't just cut it or change it. Um, and then the part that you're like, oh, I love this part. This is so fun. You know, great. More of that. 
And that the best talk is when from beginning to end, you're like, I, every minute of this is fun to do. I love it. I love, you know. So I feel the same with writing. Like if I'm fighting through a section, it's like, that's not going to be fun writing. Um, and it's when I'm going to flow being like, oh, this is so fun. Oh my God. This is like my curiosity is just like on the page. And like, I'm just like itching to get to the next thing. And like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not thirsty or hungry. And I, I have to go to the bathroom for an hour and I just won't because I'm like in this flow. That's going to be the best writing. Um, so sometimes that's just not coming. And sometimes, you know, it's, um, um, I feel like I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I hate these sentences as I'm writing them. So that's another way to snack. So these are three different, totally different reasons that I would feel stuck. Yeah. And when do you do the drawings? Do you do them as you're going? No, no, no. After. After. Yeah. The drawings I, I put in, I, 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 as I'm writing, I'll say, okay, this should be a drawing here. And I'll put in like a description in like brackets and bold, you know, of what I'm going to do which is both for me to remember, but also for if I give it for people feedback before drawings are there, I want them to be able to see what it's going to be. Um, and that come, that, that's the last thing. And that, and that part is a slog. And then I'm, I'm doing a lot of like, ah, my hand and like, I'm not very good at drawing. So it's a lot of like, oh, this, the next one comes up and I have another blank page. And I'm like, how am I going to do this thing on the page? You know, so that's miserable in that way. But it's not this like existential, like, like, I don't know how to do, I'm like, I just have to, this is just like working out. It's like going to the gym. I'm like, I just have to like power through and do six drawings a day, you know? Do you make yourself laugh when you're doing the drawings? No. Uh, it's just like serious stone. Yeah, face. usually like I'll be doing like some drawing that's like a totally this wacky stick figure. seventh drawing. And I'm just sitting, yeah, I'm just sitting here like this, <laughs> just being like, you know, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Oh, what I do a lot of is I make the facial expression inadvertently without totally subconsciously. I'll make the facial expression that I'm drawing. So I'll, my, like my wife will see me sitting there and I'll, and I'll be like, <laughs> or, 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 or I'll just be like, <laughs> and, and I don't realize I'm doing it. It's so embarrassing to get caught. But there's something about like, I'm trying to channel this like very, the facial expressions on stick figures are very subtle. And a little tiny, like extra little curl at the, in the mouth totally changes this face. So I'm like, it's very like, yeah. Okay, I got a question. You obviously have this thing with procrastination. Yeah. Do you legitimately think that you'd be more successful if you didn't procrastinate or does it serve a function in your life? And like, if so, what is like the right balance? Because you've been talking about wanting there's black focus time and then there's white free time. And I want to delineate between black and white, one or the other. But like, is that advice for you that's like directionally true? Or were, do you actually wish that you would follow it? And if you did, you would be more successful and prolific as a writer. Yeah, I think um, like the alternative to me procrastinating um, is not, I'm like, rushing through an idea, not thinking it through, just powering it out there, not mulling on anything. You know, that's never going to be me. That's just a whole different problem. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't think that would be good. I think that the mulling and some of the tortured kind of like, this isn't good enough. I need to think harder about this. I need to come back tomorrow. That is some of that's very important to do something really good. Um, or, you know, another kind of maybe productive procrastination is when I'm researching and I've, I think I kind of know enough to do it, but I'm just going to read three more sources anyway. Hmm. Because it becomes kind of fun at that point to read sources. Once you understand it, reading more sources is fun because you get to, you're like, oh, I get this. And it feels so good to like read and be like, oh, I totally get this now. Where if I had read this before, I wouldn't have understood this at all. And it's confirming that confidence. It's like, yep. And then you, you know, and then I'll just, and someone will just go watch a YouTube video on it. It's not an actual real source, but I'm like, it's, it, it, it and, and of course, if you, if, if you, you can also realize that's a way to test. You can realize I don't know some stuff there too. But the point is sometimes I could start writing and I'll go do extra research. And I do think that does serve me. It's like, you just, you'd be surprised. Each of those sources, something new comes up. Then I'm like, I'm glad I read that. Cause I just had a new insight while reading it, either because of the source or just while reading, or I learned something. So I think there's, there are, there is productive procrastination. I think the impulse that creates procrastination can also create other good things, like a really determination to make it like an A, an A plus. Um, you know, if, if it were easier, if you were just doing a B minus, you would procrastinate less. That said, um, there's just a whole, most of procrastination is just self-defeating. Um, it's just, um, you are just lacking executive function where it makes so much sense to work right now. It's a time when you're fresh. You've, a lot of the time, you have stuff to do later today. This is the writing time. You'll be so much happier later today if you just 
do your writing right now. This is going to, you know, you're going to move forward with your project. You're going to get to do more of the things you want to do because you're going to move more quickly. Um, and you're not going to be rushing at the end. You'll have more time to dig deep. So it, it is just better. Now, it's also better to work out like crazy and to sleep perfectly well and to eat perfectly well, right? And we don't do a lot of these things, right? It's like, of course, it's better to be a perfect grown up about the things like this. And, um, and, and it's just simply humans are not, don't tend to be great at being perfect grownups. And the, and the ones I talked to, I talked to Ryan Holiday recently on his podcast, and he's kind of the opposite. I'm like, you know, he's just, he writes a book a year or whatever, and he, and he, and he also has kids, and he has a farm, and he's got like a bookstore, and it's just like, how, right? Adam Grant, you know, these people. And what, and what I find is that there's, you know, it's not always the healthiest thing that creates that either. It's this, you know, there's, there's this feeling of shame if they're not doing it maybe, or there's um, it's an anxiety that, 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 that from not producing. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, it's not like it's easy to be like perfectly mentally healthy and also just perfectly productive. Humans aren't really good at this. So I don't get too, I'm not like, why do I do this crazy thing? I'm like, I do it because I'm a human and we do this, but it's the same thing where there's some people that, you know, eat pretty well, but like they cheat sometimes. And then there's some people that have a huge problem with their diet and it's like ruining their life or alcohol or, or one of these things. And, um, and I think that procrastination is like that too. It can, it can really, it can really kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's ruin, ruining my life, but I can see how it can, if it were you know, 50% worse, maybe it would legitimately be doing that. So yeah, I think less procrastination is good. And I think it's a worthy thing to try to work on. And I don't think there's this, this, this idea that like, oh, it's, it's, it procrastination is actually good because it's just that rushing isn't good. And that doesn't mean procrastination is good. Right. How do you think about the relationship between ideas and writing and like the relative importance of both of those? So would you rather have someone who's a great writer with eh, not so good ideas, great ideas, but not so good at writing? Like what is the relationship between them? I mean, I think, I don't think it's an obvious answer. I think that someone who is a great writer with okay ideas, you can enjoy their writing. You can just enjoy their wordplay and their, the humor in their writing. And maybe they're not some, saying something that original, but it's just a lot of fun to read, you know? Um, you know, I don't know, like uh, you, you can watch like uh, someone on YouTube just kind of ranting, but they're being interesting about it, even though the, with their actual ideas aren't that good, but it's fun to watch them. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I think, the, you know, the more obvious answer is to say, you know, the ideas matter more. And I think, you know, if I had to choose one, I'll choose ideas over, over great writing. Um, um, but, you know, bad writing is not fun to read. Um, and I would say, honestly, if I have to choose like truly bad writing um, with great ideas, like, like, uh, like a really dry, dense academic paper that's, I, I will not read that. No way. No. So a balance is good. And I, I, I think um, that, that really bad writing kind of just like, it's hard to, for the good ideas to even come through at all. Right. Um, did you write out your TED talk or how did writing factor into that? Well, I had already written a blog post on procrastination. So I kind of had the framework hmm. in mind, these three characters that are in my head. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote, I wrote it. I think, I think I first just wrote like bullets and then talked it out. Um, and it was like way too long, like double the length and rambly and okay. Then I, I started like those bullets got like became, you know, I, I started, um, you know, making, more involved bullets about like specifically what, what's actually going to be said here. What's not, what's the order. Cause it, to get the rambliness out and the redundancy and I would speak it again. And then I, oh, that's a good, that's, I, you know, I would just kind of talk it out loud and I would have to continue to reframe in my head because if you're, if you're, if I'm writing like a speech, I'm not going to sound like a person. So what I would do is I would, um, I would just out loud, I would just pace around and I would just say things and I would have to continue to envision that I'm just, talking to an audience. I'm talking to people because when I'm talking to, you know, uh, there's a group of people here and I'm just like talking to them. How would I actually talk? And that's very different sometimes than how I would write. So I would do that and then I would capture that and write it down. And then I would maybe work on the writing a little, revise, but then I would say it out loud and realize that sounds weird. So it's really, it was a mix back and forth. Um, but for most talks, that's not how I do it. Most talks, I, I, know what I want to say. I have my slides. I, I might do some thinking about the general structure, but the slides kind of provides that. And then I go talk it out. I just, yeah. Ted talk is different. That's it's, like the Super Bowl of talk. And it's also just an exact amount of time. Hmm. It's uh, going to be, it's a, it's going to be, you know, 
online forever. Everyone's going to see it. Uh, it, it, it. You get one take. And if you mess up a sentence, that sentence is now forever. <laughs> that, that mess up is ingrained in it forever. <laughs> It's like it's like a you know it's like a short film online where you get one take. It's this crazy thing. Uh, it's a stress stressful activity. Um, and so for that, you know, I think look, there are some very very accomplished speakers who have done their talk a million times, and they can go up there and just kind of do it. Um, this was I was very inexperienced. I'm much more experienced now. Um, and so I like I wrote I got it down to word for word, and then did the best I could to really memorize it. And I I wish I'd memorized it even better. Um, there were still a few moments when I was like what am I saying now? And then I would say like, <laughs> I would say like, so I thought about this and, and that is not in the talk. That's just me furiously trying to remember what's next. I, so I was, I pulled it off, but like barely is how I feel. So my favorite part of that talk is when you're talking about the procrastination. And I think you give three examples and you give example one, example two, and then you go, and then I'll go on Google earth and I'll start at the Southern part of India. And then I'll scroll all the way to the top of the country for two hours, and then you say it so well. You go, just to get a better feel for India. I remember the first time I heard that, I was laughing my face off. So tell, like, tell me about that. Did you rewrite that section? Do you feel like that just came out? But like those specific words, which for me, oh, those, those, every word was written there. Okay. Yeah, and naturally, that specific line had been on my blog. Um, I had used that example in one of the blog posts about it, and I specifically had written that line that, that I did it to get a better feel for India, um, which is also a true story. Every single thing in that talk and in the blog post is true. I'm not like inventing stories that sound funnier. Every th example I gave, you know, of like what my monkey says I, we should do instead of working is like ex very specific stuff I do. The India story, I've exactly done that for literally multiple hours where sometimes I'd zoom out and realize, oh, I'm still in the southern third here. <laughs> Zoom right back in, and it was a hundred percent a day when I like absolutely should have been working, um, and it's just a classic kind of thing I would do. Because also then it's this perfectionist part of me is once I start that activity, it becomes really unsatisfying to stop. So now I'm going to keep going. Now, now once it starts, oh, we're we're getting all the way to the top of India. Um, probably knowing me, I probably ended up from there into Tibet and other places. Um, but the instant gratification monkey is is creative. You know, finds. Well, if, if, if there's a part of you that is really, if, if, if you, if you have it in your head that this work is really icky and the icky is the best word I can give because that encompasses, it can be icky because it's daunting. It can be icky because it's just, um, because it's, it's just a lot. It's a hard, there's a lot you have to do. It can be icky because you're behind and you're feeling really stressed about that. So even just like just this whole thing is like, it can be um, icky because you're feeling not confident. You know, writers and confidence is like a whole dance, you know, and you can feel great. And then, you know, and so you go through these spells where you just feel like, I don't know why anyone thinks I'm good at this. I don't, or I, I lost it, what I used to have. And like, um, and, and then you write something good or someone, you get some compliment and you remind it and suddenly all this confidence shoots back and you're like, no, no, I, I got this and this is great. Oh yeah. And then you feel amazing and then you're having fun again. So it's, so for any reason it can be icky. The monkey is going to suddenly do everything to resist mm -hmm. and it will get creative. You know, you will be cleaning your apartment or you'll be, you know, you'll be doing productive stuff. That's not this, mm -hmm. or you'll be totally wasting time. Um, um, you know, you'll just whatever it is. Like you, you, you have to, you have to see this. Oh, that's this monkey doing this. That that's why I'm like having an early lunch today. It made no sense. Oh, because I didn't want to work and it was something to do. You know. So, how does playing piano as a kid and then playing a lot of music as you got to be a teenager? How does that show up in your writing? I, I think there is a lot of you know c composing music. And composing writing, you know, they have there are some parallels there, um, you know, with with um, with music. Um, what I would always try to avoid is writing stuff that's derivative, that is v sounds a lot like this artist or this category, and is kind of my version of that. It's not nothing wrong with that, but it's not going to stand out, and you're not gonna you're not gonna disrupt any kind of thing doing that, um, you know. Uh, you know, the, 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 the film scorers, which is what I was doing a long time ago, who end up, you know, doing the big, big movies, they, they developed a really unique style, kind of like that cook and the chef. They, 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 they kind of discover their own chord patterns and it's, and, 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 and their own sounds. 
versus the ones that are copying those people and using those chords that they're famous for, but doing it in their own way, um, they're not going to be doing the big, big movies. Um, you know, they're going to be doing much smaller things or video games or, or, you know, maybe, maybe TV shows, smaller TV shows. Um, and the same thing goes for bands that get huge. Usually the ones that are really famous is because they're doing something like new, you know, the, the, the Beatles is the ultimate example. They started doing, you know, derivative, but really excellent versions. You know, they were the best of the kind of derivative sound at the time. Um, and then somewhere, you know, in the mid to late sixties, they started, doing truly original stuff. So composing, you know, I would always be kind of torturing myself to not do the obvious chord now. It's like it wants to go from, you know, this to this to this to this. That's a very common pattern. I would say, okay, what's something different I can do here? But you don't want to make it sound worse. How can I do something that's different and it sounds really good? That's really hard. Mm -hmm. So writing is very similar where um, I try not to use, I try not to use like too many, um, figures of speech, you know, uh, you know, I, I try not to say stuff like, you know, cause I don't know, um, you know, however, or like, you know, you know, because, because after all they don't, I'm like, that's, 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 that's not me. That's just how writers write, you know? And so of course I do some of it. We, you know, it's impossible not to, but, um, I try to, it, it, I'd rather be doing something that is more colloquial and maybe weirder and maybe even less flowing, less beautifully written, but it's me and it's, and it's, and it's distinct than to write something that sounds like, oh, this is great writing, but it sounds a whole lot like a lot of other writers. Tell me more about the tricks that you use to get you in the writing. Because something I feel is I am the most me if I'm writing an iMessage. And then that's if it's one-on-one. -on -one. And then I'm a little bit less me if I'm writing in like a WhatsApp group chat. Mm -hmm. And then I'm definitely less me if I'm writing in Google Docs. What tricks have you cultivated so that you can get more of yourself into your writing? It's, it's honestly, it's very intangible. It's a lot about mood and emotions that are going through you. Like, again, confidence. Um, if I, if there's a lot of me in, in a writing, it means I was pretty confident when I was writing that. I was feeling like, like, um, this is my, domain here and I'm having fun and you're welcome to join. I don't care if you don't, because this is how I I'm here having fun in my own way. Right. I'm not trying to impress anyone and I'm just being like silly if I'm being silly at all, or I'm, um, um, and of course that's going to be more original. You know, that's just going to, you're going to bring it. You're going to, if, if the writing, if the, if the palette is your kind of like your plaything, and you're just like, I'm just going to screw around on this thing. And it's like, um, and it's like, whatever, it's just this, you know, I, I, I can break all the rules. That's, going to be, um, there's a lot of confidence involved in that. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're not feeling confident, that's when I'm going to be much more, you know, um, writing, uh, less interestingly, you know, more kind of matter of fact explaining. And then no, now sometimes it just, something calls for an explanation. You can't be silly in every paragraph, of course. So, you know, there's also a, a, a matter of choosing when to do it. Um, especially, you know, if you're writing something emotional or serious, like, you know, obviously you don't want to kill the tone by sometimes it's not about you, right. you know? So sometimes you're writing something about someone else or about an idea or about something. And it's like, it's no one needs to hear your little personality right now. <laughs> so there's also an element of, you know, choosing when, but, um, but I think the times when I know I should be doing that, I should be having more fun and I'm not I put, putting more of me in. Um, I think it's about mood. I think like having a few drinks can help. Um, I think uh, trying, you know, taking a break and coming back to it or force kind of forcing myself to pause and be like, what would this be like if I were just blogging? If this, if this were 2006 and I were just blogging about this, you know, how would I explain this to a friend? Um, and then so it'll trigger that, that kind of, groove and I'm like, okay, right. And then suddenly I'm having more fun. Or you can go read, read other writers that you think write colloquially that are a lot of fun. Who's that for you? Oh, there's a lot. I mean, Bill Bryson is oh, great. Yeah. Um, I love Scott Alexander's blog. He writes really, um, I mean, there's really silly blogs, hyperbole and a half, right? One of my favorite blogs. Um, and she's the silliest and the most, she's the, uh, on the far end of the spectrum, Ali Brosh of like putting herself into it and being silly, but it's amazing. She's incredible. Um, and like, looking at something like that just to remind me or looking at my old writing, looking at, looking at like a piece of stuff when I was having fun to be like, this, this is fun. It's like almost like I, you know, I want to like remind myself, this is fun. Mm -hmm. Have fun. Right. This isn't a chore. You're not in college. This isn't a college paper. You're not, you know, 
if it says, you know, if, if you're not having fun, then write something different here. Don't, don't, don't do it. You know, now again, that's again, for a blog post, that's easier for a book. There is just a slog element to it. You can't just have fun on every single page. And, um, and, and even if you are, it's just a lot of writing to do. So, you, you know, it's not always going to be fun, but you can just some reminders like this, you know, to snap yourself back into that zone. Do you still use text edit for a lot of your writing? Oh yeah. Why? Because it That's is so random. All I want is literally a white rectangle where I can, that's no formatting and no bullshit, no tools. I want to be able to make it bold or not bold, change the font size, to make it caps or not caps and add color if I want to. And that's, that's every, and then an indent different indents. That's a ton of tools right there. Everything I just said, I can have 10 different, 20 different classifications of stuff. And I know what everything, I know what green means. I know what red means. I know what bold and red means versus not bold. And I know what two indents means versus one. And I know what sp uh, putting three spaces in between versus just next line. All of that has me, it's my own code. And I'm sure that if I practice for a while on 10 different pieces of, you know, outlining software or whatever, I'm sure that one of them I'd say, okay, you know what, this is this is better. But like, this is working fine. And I know I'm being an old man about this, but I have tried other software I have. And it's like, I just feel frustrated because I just want to like move this there. And I have to go in and like highlight and like do this. And then like, I have to go in and I have to like expand and I just want it here. And then if I if, if it's too much in this doc, I want to make another doc. And then I want to have a sh the short version doc and then the long doc and then a little doc here, which is just a scratch pad for what I'm doing <laughs> right now. And that's not my actual writing. Then I'll do I'll do that in Microsoft Word, which I also have. People can't believe I still use Word, but I tried other things, and I'm just like you know, like the editing process and the track changes, and like I don't love Word at all. But I I, I it, it just is it just it's basic and it gets the job done. So um, I'm always open to suggestions, but. I will say my, my assistant has gotten me onto Workflowy for like certain outlining things or she'll put her notes, her research notes in Workflowy and that it is a really good piece of software. Um, but I just look back at text edit and I'm like, because I have, you know, I just have such a code with myself for that. It's really easy to use. It's also, you just close it. It's just all saved. Even if something's not say if even the doc is still untitled, um, and you open it and they all open to the exact mosaic you had them in. Um, and they're not, you know, it never takes a long time to open. You don't need any software. I don't know. So that's how I feel about it's it. It's funny. You were talking about Microsoft Word and I had this vivid memory of my mom teaching me that when you're writing in Word, you have to press command S. Command and I S, still S, do. S. Me too. I still do it. Like, because they don't, let you, they don't auto save because you have to use their stupid OneDrive or whatever it is, which I don't want to use. So it is the. Like the this happened a couple times with the last book where I it would crash. Worst feeling ever. Or the power would go out, and now it does it does do some form of autosave because it would the doc would come up and say recovered. Yeah. But that recovered doc might be up to date. It might be one paragraph behind, or it might be three pages behind. It, it's it's very unpredictable, and I have legit and losing writing of. Even two Horrible. sentences is excruciating. Horrible. Because you worked hard on that writing and maybe you also were really happy with the wording of certain parts and you, you can't replicate it. You, you can't remember exactly how you did it. And it just it's just something that's so torturous about doing writing you've already done. But the fact, I was like, I can't believe whatever it was that year, 2021, 20, and this is still happening. Yeah. Every other every other software just auto saves now. So yes, it's, it's maddening. But, um, you know, it, it also is just... It's very functional. Why are you grateful for David McCullough's book on John Adams? It was one of the, I read that in college. And I, um, I'm one of many people who loves history, but graduated high school thinking he hated history. Hmm. That's a very common story, I find. Because history in school, unless you were lucky to have a great teacher, great history teacher is like this godsend that I never had. Sorry to any history teachers of mine that are watching this. I don't think any are. Um, <laughs> they weren't good. They weren't good at all. Like they, they, they didn't have passion for the subject. They were, or, or they, they just were. It, it felt. Ran First of all, it's not even like you know. Of course, the ultimate bad history is like you're just memorizing dates. Um, you know, you're just. You know, you're memorizing, you know, and you're spitting out like, okay, that that multiple choice test. It's kind of crazy how we teach history. Like it's the most vivid. 
thing of all these it's amazing things. It's better than any fiction story. And you're saying passion for the subject. It's a, it's not, it's the best fiction story and we're characters in it. It's literally like, do you want to know about the story that we're inside of? It's so interesting. Plus it's, people love gossip. History is just drama and gossip. And it's like this crazy thing that happened, this bet these betrayals and then these surprise attacks. And then there's this, this giant movement and everyone like, you know, <laughs> this big picture, you know, uh, the, the, the creation of a new paradigm of all the way we all lived. And then that failed because of this, whatever. But a lot of the, listening to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, yeah. for example, he's telling stories like soap opera. You're watching, you know, it's like, it's not a very highbrow part of me that I'm not like, haha, I'm listening to my like history. I'm sitting there like, like it's basically I'm addicted to a really good soap opera. Um, and um, I'm, you know, uh, so anyway, David McCullough's book was one of the first experiences I had when I was like, this is amazing. History is amazing. Um, even just that specific topic. You know, it's about John Adams, but it's really, of course, about the founding of the U.S. You learn a ton about Washington and Jefferson and, you know, uh, Madison, all the people at the time. I had learned about that topic in a really boring ways, many times. You know, that was a just just super boring. And, um, and so, A, it was this incredible story. One of the most, if you're an American, like, what could be more interesting than, like, these groups of, basically a group of dudes in their 20s, um, and a couple older ones who got together, like who had read a ton of philosophy and knew a lot of law and were like, we have the rare chance to start a country from scratch. Like let's, and they invented the U S it like, is striking how literate they were. They were incredibly educated and smart. Yeah. Um, like they really knew, they knew ancient philosophy. They knew modern philosophy. They had, they, they, they were enlightenment people. They spent all their time, you know, drinking coffee and arguing with each other as opposed to before that, you know, drinking in the saloons. If this had been a different time, those guys would be drinking in the saloons and arguing about their, you know, whatever, you know, dumb shit and not doing, you know, the, they were products of their time. Um, but anyway, it wasn't just that. It wasn't just this great story, but it was the details. It was that, I, you know, I didn't I think I quite understood because in history class, I never quite understood like how much we do know about the details. So it was that John Adams' letter, because he was this mythic figure to me, this like painting, this guy in a painting. It's his letter to his wife, you know, letters to his, his wife and his diary about, you know, how he needs to stop, you know, going out with girls in college and focus on his books. And I'm like, John Adams was like a college kid who was like hitting on girls, like what? And like, I, I realized like, I'm like in the 1700s now. I feel like I was in a time machine. I'm like learning about the quirks and how they wrote. And like, so it was a double whammy of like the, the big story so good. The details are so interesting. And it, it just, for me, it birthed like, uh, and I still today, I've, I've read a ton of history books and I even more so like love history podcasts. Um, and the more you learn, the more interesting it becomes because you have a foundation. And now when someone mentions the late eight stages of the Roman empire, you've learned about that seven times from seven different sources. So you really you know, you can place that in a place in your brain, you know where it goes, and that makes it even more fun to learn. Yeah, I like what you're saying about the big story, super interesting, the details are really good. How do you think about that when you're editing of building an intuition, a taste for what details are worth including because they add life to the piece, they add vigor and color and a sense of realism and actually like an integrity to the writing, but then also sometimes you'll be reading an academic paper or you'll be reading some biography on page like 274, and they're still on like what this person was wearing when they were like six years old, going to their first piano recital or something, you're like, okay, you can spare these details. How do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really like interesting thing to think about, which is just the, so a lot of these things, there's balance, right? There's like, um, there, there's, a, there's, there's a certain time for details and a certain time for, so the, I'm do, doing a book now, which is the biggest arc ever. It's like the whole big history and the future and everything. And what, you know, what you realize when you're writing and, um, is that actually just zooming out is it can be interesting, but it's like you said, it's hard to have credibility. Um, if you just zoom out and it's also, um, if, if, if you're just, talking about the biggest picture. It's a little like, why should I listen to you about this? Or like, you know, you maybe, you, you know, maybe you can, maybe you're framing this thing interestingly, but like, I don't know, you're, you're losing a lot of what's interesting. Like the big zoom out on like, you know, I don't know, evolution. And then like reptiles split with mammals. And then like reptiles went and, um, you know, uh, and, and would develop in this way and mammals would develop in this way. And then it's like, there, that is interesting. But first of all, a lot of people know that stuff. 
And a lot of the 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 epiphanies they're going to have, the, the the dopamine hits are going to be in the details. Mm. But of course, also, like you said, um, I still want to remind everyone that we're on one big arc here, and I want the big arc to blow people's minds as well. So, um, a lot of what the way I will choose what to put in is just my own experience. I always assume that my readers are like me, my level of intelligence and education and knowledge and curiosity. It's just the easiest way. And you know, when you write a lot uh, and you're gonna attract the people that happen to think like you or like be interested in the same things. So if I got a dopamine hit from a certain factoid, it's gonna probably be in the book. Um, and a lot of times I, I don't, I'll read a factoid and I'm just like, eh, okay, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, you know, around the time we split with chimps, the population of the, the, the common ancestor was, you know, 300,000. I'm like, okay. Like, I, I'm just like, that's, that's information, but I'm not like 300,000. That's so small. That's so big. Or like, oh, now I'm glad I know that. I'm like, okay. It's like, there's a million facts that come my way like that. And most of them I'm like, okay, fine. That's not. And then once and something I'll come across and it'll be like, you know, some fact that absolutely blows my mind or just like, you know, chimps, I was just reading today, chimps, um, are, uh, tend to, the habitat of a chimp tends to be eight square miles and the habitat of a hunter gatherer, 500 square miles, which is one of the reasons that we went bipedal because it uses one quarter of the energy to walk the same distance as it does to walk on all fours. Hmm. Okay, I'm like that eight versus 500. That's, I, I was like, mm, that, that to me was like, wow, I didn't realize how small, you know, chimps, eight square miles is like a two by two, you know, chimps live in like the whole, the whole life in like a little space. Okay, that was interesting. 500 miles is massive. Um, you know, these hunter gatherers would cover great distances and the differences when we all had a common ancestor. Okay. That to me is interesting. It's not the most interesting fact. It's not like, I'm not like, oh my God, but I'm like that, that, <laughs> that one, that one makes the cut at least on round one. Maybe I'll cut it in the second round, but like that to me, plus it seems like it was an important part. I, I actually needed to explain that to help explain why we walked long distances. So that's just two random examples I was just thinking about with the, what I'm researching right now. But, um, there's a lot of that I'm trying to using my own taste for if it's interesting or not. Yeah. I mean, I think that you're real, sort of like Bill Bryson, actually, the implicit argument is, okay, there are these very specific parts of the world. And if you can get really excited about diving in, exploring that thing, then you can realize that actually this thing that seems really dry is actually incredibly interesting. And I guess you went down this rabbit hole of the history of English podcast and you're like, oh, history of English, like, okay, whatever, it's just some language. And it sounds like you had another one of these realizations. And that's, I think, what you do for other people when you write. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think uh, the history podcast I listen to, History of English, The Fall of Civilizations, Hardcore History, um, uh, Revolutions, Explorers, these are all great history podcasts. What they all have in common is they have great taste for what's interesting. Um, and so the amount of filtering they must do, you know, I imagine that these, um, these hosts, like they learn 10 X what they actually put in. And so there's a, that, that is the skill. I mean, Bill Bryson's another perfect example. I mean, the amount of research he must do to write a book like the body love great book. But what the body is, is it is, it's like what a stand-up comedian does. It is the most interesting things that he came across. I agree with his taste. I, he happens to share my taste on what's interesting. So when he is gonna go uh, on an extra deep diversion about something, almost every time I'm like happy he digs, I'm like, oh, that was great, you know? And, I, and if he's not, I'm assuming I wouldn't have liked it anyway. And so I, that is, um, I think the, the goal for as a reader is to not find, it's not about objectively great taste, it's finding people um, who happen to be interested in exactly the level you are. If they're going deeper and they're you're boring you, that doesn't mean you're stupid or they're, you know, you should like this. No, 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 they're just, it's a bad match. Find someone that's a little bit less deep or on the other hand, like find someone that, that explains it more thoroughly if you feel like you're just getting a surface and you're unsatisfied. Right. Tell me about this idea that you have around research where you're researching and you're researching, maybe you're playing around, maybe it's actually the procrastination monkey that's really taking control of the wheel here and you're looking and you're not actually sure what you're looking for, but maybe you have some sort of sense inside your body where you're like, hey, my compass is sort of directing me over there and I'm not really sure why, but I've just done this many times before and I feel like there could be gold over there. I think that's an interesting idea of research as the 
chasing of surprise, but you have enough experience that you're like, actually, I just know that there could be gold there, but I can't actually put into words or articulate why I know that. Yeah. Um, so like, I'm just thinking about like researching the history of humans, which I'm doing right now. You know, I want to read about Lucy, the famous skeleton of an Australopithecus um, from, I think she was from four and a half billion years ago. I know Lucy's important to include, but I'm not sure if it's just like, here's a, a fossil that we have um, of this stage. And this is an Australopithecus and this is some stuff about them and we move on. And what happens is as you go, like you said, you know, you, you realize, oh, okay, that actually Lucy's really interesting because it's part of this bigger story of, you know, this, she was bipedal, but she wasn't smart yet. Oh, that's so interesting that we were like walking around before we were, you know, human level intelligence, whatever it is like, and you know, usually your curiosity is the guide. If your curiosity is just like, ooh, 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 this is interesting. And oh, I'm learning stuff. Okay, good, you're in a good place. Versus if you're reading and it just seems dry and it seems confusing and, and not interesting, then maybe you have to learn more or maybe it's not, that interesting. There's a lot of stuff that's also just not that interesting. And um, don't include it just for the sake of being a perfectionist. Just, just cut it out or mention it quickly and move on. Growing up, we had this giant history book that my mom would always point me to and say, go read this. This is the most interesting way to learn history. And there were basically no words. It was all charts and graphs showing the chronology and the lineage of different things that happened. That sounds amazing. So you could be what like- What book is this? I want I this. I remember the color and I- This is I my will, dream book. Yeah, it was, it was great yeah. because you would be like, okay, the Wright brothers were doing this at the same time that this happened. Like, for example, cubism is right around the time of Sigmund Freud and then Dali comes right after. Okay, so then we have Sigmund Freud, which then leads into the surrealist art movement. Oh, now that these things are overlapped on each other, I can see how there's a relationship there. There's a story that reveals itself. Yes. That otherwise you just had isolated things you don't know there. There's an interesting story there. And so often history is very isolated in terms of what it's pointing to. So it'd be like the history of painting, the history of psychology. Totally. But this makes them overlapping and you begin to see all of these things and the author doesn't even have to say anything for you to learn a bunch. Yeah, it's like, um, I think what's interesting, I actually have a term for this, it's, I call it horizontal history. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, that's a little confusing without any explanation, but I think of it as like, if history is going backwards, these threads that go down in time. So we're at the present and you're going back to the 19th century and 18th century and whatever. And you can tra trace, you can say, what's the history of art? Okay, let's just look back at it and let's, let's trace it up. So horizontal history is taking a snippet, a cross section. Right. And then you're actually understanding a time um, much better. You know, the, you can go back to the early 1500s and you had, you know, you had the um, Protestant Reform Reformation was in a similar time to the Age of Exploration, which was in a similar time to like Copernicus discovering his stuff. And you can kind of get the vibe of the time back then. You know, Shakespeare, I think, was a right around. So it's, um, yeah. I, I, li I like that. Yeah. I, anything that helps orient you a little bit more and make history a little bit more real. And that's what becomes so interesting is like the people in the 1500s didn't know they were like in the ancient 1500s. They thought they were in the cutting edge present like right. we do. And they were living and they're like, wow, you know, my grandparents, my parents grew up in like, you know, the 1400s, but we're in like the new time. We're in the 1500s right. now. It is like the new. printing press, yeah, exactly. Gutenberg. Yeah, 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 exactly. The kids these days, they don't even know what because <laughs> now they're 1500s kids, like nothing will ever be the, right? And we think of this, this old, old school time, but like, it's so interesting remembering that this was, these were just people. And like there were clouds and there were birds chirping and like the rain was coming down and like the people were in a bad mood and then they were like constipated and then that, and then they had like a uh, sore throat and like, and then, you know, they were jealous of their friend's girlfriend. Like the, it was just people, yeah. just, they were 1500 people and they didn't know about galaxies or atoms or a lot of stuff, but they were, you know, so yeah, I can do this all day. That's why I like the details of history are so interesting. So if we all of a sudden had 250 high schoolers in the room and you're like, this is gonna be the Tim Urban seminar to writing and you have one day to teach them, how would you structure and outline how you're gonna teach people to write in the way that you've learned to do it? Oh, geez. Well, I'd wanna think about it a lot more than however long I'm gonna think about it now because that's, it's something that, um, you know, I can, there's definitely that, 
to do the A plus at this, I would need to think about it for a long time. And they're like, please, 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 please make it fun because they don't like school and you're just this guy. You're like this old guy who's yeah. walking in. So it's like, you gotta captivate them. How do you think about it? I mean, I think I would just use my own experience and my own experience was that I thought I hated writing. I did hate writing in college. Um, just like history, I learned that this thing is boring because it was boring in school. And then I started doing this other thing, blogging, that I didn't even think of as writing and it was super fun. But actually, it is writing. It's just that writing can be really fun. I would talk to each of them, or I want them to spend a few minutes thinking about like what is fun for them to talk about. What do they talk about with their friends? What's interesting? What do they think is funny? Um, what does it does it sound fun to write like to create a little world to create like a little fiction world? Does it sound fun to explain something you already know? Does it sound fun to try to make funny observations about life? Does it whatever? And, and, and figure out like, and, and then just say, go and have some fun on the paper. Just do something and, and you have to have fun. Get them in that, I would try to, I want them to have that experience of like, my creativity is like out and about and I'm tickled by it. And then I wanna do more of this maybe. And then I have all this confidence um, now that I didn't have before that I can be creative. And you know, I just think I would wanna break them out of a bunch of things that I know I was in back then. So I, I, would, I, would, they would do, I would want them to have the experience I had when I started blogging, which is just like, no pressure, the opposite of school. No pressure, you don't have to be a good writer, you just, just, just write how you talk, just have fun and, and, and write me something like, may, teach me something or make me laugh or bring me into some world, anything you want. Um, that's what I would, I would want them to have that experience throughout the day. And then hopefully they, that's going to trigger, hopefully some of them to keep going with it. Why do you think that there's such a seriousness about writing as a medium and a way to communicate? It's not like this in speaking. No, I think that first of all, a lot of the writing that is out there is incredibly serious. Academic writing is serious and boring. And that's by the way, what we're trained on. We're trained right. essentially on the child version of academic writing, which is hard to read. It's hard to write. It's not it's not fun, yeah, but, but it is, you know, it's not that it's just bad. It, it, it is the way it is for a reason and that it's, it is trying to be a hyper organized um, and, you know, way to prove something, you know, using very kind of strict set of um, conventions. Yeah. Um, the same way like an architect would do their thing in a very specific, you know, they're not going to be having fun in their architect. They're trying to, you know, create a blueprint that the, the, the builder can now use to, there's going to be conventions there. What's funny that I'm hearing about your saying about what you're saying is you're almost saying that there's a trade-off between fun and efficiency that as a field or whatever continues, it gets more efficient, but it loses its fun. And I actually don't think that's necessarily true. I think some, some writing that's not at all dry can be very efficient. Hmm. You know, Paul Graham, his articles are, they're not academic at all. They're extremely plain, small words. They're easy to read, they're fun to read, but they're extremely efficient. I think it's more just that like, it's a discipline. Academic writing is a specific discipline. It's, a spe it's almost like a science. It has its own methods and the, it's that for a reason and it's predictable um, for the peer reviewers and whatever else. Um, and, I think in school, we're kind of taught a kid version of that, where you're taught to prove, you know, a, write a thesis statement and then um, very organized writing in it. Look, I'm sure there's some benefit to it. You're helping kids learn how to organize their thoughts. You're helping kids learn how to read something and develop an, a, 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 an opinion about it and then have to, you know, go and prove that opinion and then bring a counter argument. And I think that is valuable. The downside is that if that's all the writing you're doing, you learn this lesson is that writing is serious. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that anyone who starts reading fun books knows that writing does not have to be serious. And you know, right alongside you writing these boring papers, you're reading Roald Dahl or whatever. And so- um, You ever read Captain Underpants? No. That was a great one. Sounds great. And also my cousin used to read Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And these, these books, they were fun and they were goofy. Yeah. And they were sort of cartoonish, but what I like about them is that they get people into reading. And then for me, I've gone into the meatier, more serious stuff, but trying to throw Romeo and Juliet on me in fourth grade, but soft, what light through yonder window break. It's like, <laughs> I'm not ready for it is the East and Juliet is the sun. No, it's really confusing. <laughs>
<laughs> and like, you're just like, it's, it's just, yeah, I totally agree. I, I, I think, I just think it can be, there's no reason that, look, there's, there's a few core skills you have to build in kids. And, and some of those aren't going to be fun. You know, some of it's going to be like weightlifting. But I think that like that could be 20% of what they're doing. And 80% could be fun. And some of that fun is building core skills. 20% maybe has to be dry, maybe. Maybe not even. But um, right now I feel like 90% of, of school is dry. And, and it's kind of geared around a test. And it makes, it, the big lesson kids get is that learning sucks. <laughs> and uh, Which is crazy. Yeah, because kids are, have so much natural curiosity. And, um, um, you know, look how a kid picks up a, a video game or something and they get right. fire brains for when they, they, they get engaged in something. So how do you, you know, get them into that zone about edu their education somehow, you know? Last question. As you are beginning to wrap up a piece and you're doing that final edit, like this is the one, you're now the gatekeeper before this is going to be public. Everybody's going to be able to see it and be like, Tim Urban was totally wrong. Oh my goodness, he was totally right. Hey, that was funny. That was boring. How do you think about being that final gatekeeper and doing that last edit? Do you do it on your phone? Do you like print it out and like scribble, scrabble? What do you do? I read, you know, look, I'm trying to write things that I would like to have someone send me. That's always the goal. Like if I'm writing a, a book or a blog post, I'm like trying to think about what would on this topic, what would I love someone to, what I would, what I love to read how, and how would it be the most fun way? So I'm trying to create that, which means that I also should like reading it back, especially since I forget some of the stuff. So I'm just trying to read it basically and enjoy it. And if there's parts when I'm like, Oh wow, I'm like this is this is not interesting or this is not clear or this is bad. You know, I will um I'll change it. But I I, I am basically trying to I'm I'm saying this, I'm having the experience right now that other other people are about to have. Um and I'm just trying to use my taste. I'm not I'm, you know, I'm just trying to kind of sit back and almost hopefully enjoy it and be like, "Oh yeah, this is this is so fun or this is so interesting or like, "Oh yeah, that is funny. Like that's such a funny way to and and if I'm if I'm enjoying my own thing, I'm th I know other people are going to also. So I I, I just kind of, you know, trying to put myself pretend I'm a reader basically. Um but by that point, you know, that 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 read usually happens a little earlier like the very last read or two is probably going to be you know, very technical. Kind of very technical things are just a little tiny word change here and there and um yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me.